Nekom nikmas b'nei Yisrael meisam edyonim. You should avenge the vengeance of the Israel from the Midianites. Acha teyosef el amecho. And then you're going to pass on from your people. Mean Then you're going to pass away. So Rashi over here on the next posuk. Vaydabe Moshe lom leimor. As soon as Hashem says he should avenge the vengeance of the Midianites, although he will pass away afterwards, immediately afterwards, you should gather from yourselves men for battle, for conscription. View al Midian, and they should come upon Midian. Loseis nikmas Hashem be Midian. To avenge the vengeance of Hashem against Midian. When Hashem speaks to Moshe, you should avenge the vengeance of Bnei Yisrael. They try to destroy the Jewish people. And Moshe, when he get, get, says it over and he communicates to them, he says, Avenge the vengeance of Hashem. So he did not give the instruction based as with the intent that Hashem had said. Let's see Rashi. Vaydabe Moshe, api sheshoma shem isoso tlui bedover. Although Moshe heard, understood that his death was contingent on this battle, also besimcho, lo icher. He did it with joy, and he did not delay. Now the question is, why should he delay? It says, although he, he understood, he heard, because Hashem says, and then you will pass away, he did it besimcha, he did it with joy, and he did not delay. Firstly, how do we know he did it with joy? He did it. You know, sometimes you do something because you have to do it. But Rosh says, no, he did it with joy. How do we know he did it with joy? Just simple, simple understanding. And the question is, and if he did do it with joy, as we're going to explain in a moment, why did he do it with joy? Although he knew that his death would be determined by the victory over the Midianites. Anoshim, and who are the ones who are eligible for this battle? Tzadikim. Chein Omar, Bochar, Bochar Lor Anoshim. When they had to choose people qualified for the court, there would be Anoshim. Chein Anoshim, Chachomim, Viduim. This is in when Moshe recounts what took place over the 40 years before he passes away. He says there had to be Chachomim, Yiduim. Again, regarding the judicial system. Nikma Hashem. Now Rashi cites the Medrash. Why? Although Hashem said Nikma Yisrael, the vengeance of the Jewish people against Midian, but Moshe said Nikma Hashem. Sha'omet Kenegid Yisrael. Because the enemies against the Jews. Ki'ilu Omet Kenegid HaKosh The enemies of the Jews are the enemies of Hashem. So the Midrash speaks that more clearly. Hashem says to Moshe, if I told you Nikmas Yisrael, why did you say Nikmas Hashem? So Moshe says to Hashem, if we would be idolaters, if we would be heretics, if we would have never received Torah Sinai, would they want to destroy us? They would have wanted to destroy us. The only reason why we want, they want to destroy us is because we're your people. Because they want to eradicate your representation in this existence. If that is the case, going against the Jewish people is going against you. Therefore, I said Nikmas Hashem rather than Nikmas Yisrael because to give the Jews an understanding why exactly they were attacked and they wanted to annihilate them because they themselves are God's representation in this existence. That's how the Midrash speaks it out. From Rashi, it says that because we're your people, because we are your people, therefore it's called God's vengeance. But it's this is the reason. 
because we are his representation. And if we'd be something other than that, they would want to destroy us. We'd be no different than any other threat. But over here, it's because of, and that's really, that's the root of anti-Semitism. Although the non-Jew in his own mind believes, and he has his own reason why the Jew should be destroyed, but the reality is, is because this is the battle between the good and evil forces in existence, what the Jew represents and what the nations of the world represent. And because of that, that's the reason why there's this animosity and this hate where they justify to destroy us. Now, there's a midrash. The midrash tells us, not here, that every nation that attempted to destroy us had said that the ones previously who were our oppressors, they didn't succeed because they made a mistake. But we're not going to make that mistake. And we will destroy them. And everyone attempts, and not only don't they destroy us, they themselves are destroyed through us and they go into the dustbins of history. And every civilization that attempts to destroy us says the same thing. The reason why the previous civilization weren't able to destroy the Jews is because there was an oversight, Because, but if they would have addressed whatever that was, they would have succeeded. And this mistake is made over and over again. But what is, what is the understanding? Again, it's exactly what we're speaking about over here. That since Klal Yisro, we represent Hashem's existence in this world. And Hashem, God is our backer. And therefore, His presence has to be present. Otherwise, the world would not exist. Therefore, the Jew always succeeds despite the fact that we're outnumbered overwhelmingly and logically, we should be destroyed. I always say over from Rabbi Yaakov Emden, he writes, he has a commentary on the Siddur that in the introduction he writes, he says, although we no longer live in an era, Rabbi Yaakov Emden lived in the late, later part of the 1700s, early 1800s, he says, although today we don't live in the era of revealed miracles, but there's one revealed miracle which continues throughout history, the existence of the Jewish people. Despite the fact that every civilization wanted to destroy us, they're no longer here, we're still here. That itself is a revealed miracle. And that confirms that Hashem is behind us, not allowing us to be taken out of existence. But again, getting back, Rashi says, although Moshe heard, understood that his death was contingent on this battle, nevertheless, he did it with simcha, he did it with joy. Why did he do it with joy? Okay? We had discussed that Moshe Rabbeinu did not participate in the building of the Mishkan. And he was disappointed. And Hashem says to Moshe, why are you disappointed? He says, because I was concerned that if I will participate, I may have denied another Jew an opportunity to participate. So I, what I said was, let them do what has to be done. And if there's any shortfall, I'll enter into that situation and I'll complete the Mishkan. But factually, they completed it and there's nothing left for me to do. That's the reason why I feel disappointed that I wasn't able to participate in the building of the Mishkan. So Hashem says to Moshe, your involvement is greater than theirs. They built the Mishkan, but you will erect the Mishkan. And we had mentioned they attempted to erect the Mishkan. They weren't able to erect the Mishkan because you needed a miracle because of the weight of the beams. But Hashem did not perform the miracle on their behalf because Hashem wanted Moshe Rabbeinu should be the one to erect the Mishkan. But Moshe's reason was, I want the Jews to do what they have to do. I don't want to deny a Jew the opportunity of his participation in the Mishkan. Yet we find by the Nesim, by the princes, by the inauguration of the Mishkan, they were there first. Why? Because they had made a mistake and the Torah openly indicates this point that Hashem was disappointed with the Nesim. Because the word Nesim, the Yud in Nesim, the Yud is the leader to indicate there was a deficiency in the participation. Because what did they say? Let the Jews do what they have to do. And whatever they're not able to accomplish, we'll fill in the gaps. So that itself was what was considered a deficiency. Why? Because it says it was only as a 
result of their laid backness that they come up with this understanding, let them do, and whatever the shortfall is, we'll fill in the gaps. We'll pick up the slack, so to say. So Hashem says, it's due to your atzlus, to your laid backness, that's why you did this. So we ask the question, I mean, Moshe Rabbeinu, his response to Hashem, why he didn't participate is verbatim what they said. They're reprimanded for this. Moshe is not reprimanded. And Moshe is, is just to the, concept, to the contrary. He's, he's praised for this. And therefore he says, your, your revival will be greater. Why is Moshe seen in this positive light and they're seen in negative light? That's the question we asked. So we had said was, if a person's offered an opportunity, such as building the Mishkan, in terms of that and the value, that it's a full reinstatement, creating a new connection to God. Without it, we don't have that relation with God. And you have that opportunity. As a human being, immediately, if you appreciate that, all you think about is that opportunity. Not because you want to do the opportunity. Because to have... Your relationship reinstated, you're there immediately. It's impossible not to. The only reason why a person could delay is only because there's a certain lack of, a pre there's a laid backness over here. But if you'd get it, there's no way that you can make a calculation why you should not do it, somebody else should do it. So the only reason why they were able to make that calculation is because there was a certain lack of full appreciation and that was due to the laid backness. But Moshe Rabbeinu, on the other hand, that God himself attested to the fact, he's owner of Mikalodom, that he was the most humble person who ever lived. Nach no more, there wasn't a trace of himself. Every aspect of his being was to do for God's glory. So the only reason Moshe could have held back and not participated is the only reason. So then to see him themselves, where you're at, that there is an aspect of yourselves, you should have been there first and foremost. Because you are first and foremost. This opportunity can't pass up. Moshe Rabbeinu, on the other hand, who has no trace of himself, everything is for the sake of God. Therefore, he was said, I, I don't want to deny another Jew the opportunity. Therefore, Moshe is praised and they're criticized for the same thing. Now, Moshe is given the opportunity to destroy the nation that brought about a level of Chil Hashem that if not for Pinchas' participation, intervention, and zealotry, the Jewish people would have been destroyed. So who are these people? These people are the arch enemies of God. If you're the arch enemies of God and you only live for God's glory and this is the will of God, they should be destroyed because of what they attempted to do. Therefore, for Moshe Rabbeinu, if he does this, it's nothing less than besimcha. He doesn't think about it because it's demise. But your demise, you're gonna pass away immediately, immediately after victory. It's like Avram going to the Akeda. This is Avram Kalkel says Ashura. All Moshe Rabbeinu's focus is at this point is God's glory. What's God's glory? Destroying the Midianites. If that's the case, that that is demise would be dependent upon this. There's no calculations whatsoever. I'd said something similar. We find that Moshe Rabbeinu was chosen to be the conduit for the giving of the Torah at Sinai. Now, the Gemara tells us in Shabbos, what is God's signet? The signet of Hashem is truth. It's truth. The Torah itself, Shlomo says in Mishlei, what is the only thing which is unadulterated truth? That's the Torah itself. Emes Kenev al Timkar. Acquire truth, don't sell it. So Shlomo Melech, when he quantifies Torah, it's truth on the absolute level. Now Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu was the adopted grandson of Paro. At the age of 18, he goes out of the palace and he sees an Egyptian beating a Jew to death. Immediately intervenes and he kills the Egyptian. He looks in every direction to make sure no one's looking and he kills him. Although he knew at that moment there's a chance that somebody may see, nevertheless, he killed the Egyptian. Now what would have been the consequence of killing that Egyptian if word would get back to Paro. He'd have to flee from Egypt. They would put him to death, which they attempted to. If the only advocate of the Jews in the palace of Paro 
is Moshe knowing he's a Jew? How do you put everything into jeopardy? By killing the Egyptian. Nevertheless, that was not a reason for Moshe Rabbeinu not to kill the Egyptian. Because if there's such a miscarriage of justice, here the man rapes the man's wife. And then when the man becomes aware of what happened, he begins beating him to death, this is intolerable. So justice demands immediately action, immediate action. But think about the ramifications of this. You will no longer be the advocate of the Jews if it's found out. It was a, Moshe Rabbeinu at that moment. Moshe Rabbeinu, he represented truth at that special level. All that matters is justice has to be delivered. At all costs, meaning that possibility, he may be found out, it didn't register whatsoever. So Moshe Rabbeinu, what was his persona? Moshe Rabbeinu's persona was Emes. Emes, there's no calculations. Emes has to be addressed. Moshe Rabbeinu flees to, to Midjan. Miraculously, he was able to flee to Midjan. And now he goes there and he finds these women shepherdesses being attacked by male shepherds. What does Moshe do? He immediately enters into the fray, fights them off, and he saves the day for them. Moshe Rabbeinu is a fugitive. It's essential that it's not know where he is. He fled Egypt. So how do you go do such a public event, beating off these shepherds, where it's going to get back to Egypt? Again, this is the display of Moshe's emiss. Moshe's emiss, when you're at that level of truth, there's no calculation whatsoever. Justice has to be delivered. This is a mis miscarriage of justice, unacceptable, he acts. The Gemara tells us in Sanhedrin that mitzvah lasus pshora, that a judge, if he could mediate and bring about a compromise between both defendants, mitzvah lasus pshora. But the Gemara says, Moshe Rabbeinu never ever allowed a pshara to be making if he was overseeing the case, if he was adjudicating it. What was Moshe Rabbeinu's approach? Yaakov had din If the din said one thing, and there's a mountain that interferes with the halacha, we say the din pierces the mountain. It has to be justice. And the Gemara says, Aaron was pshara. Oev shalom, rodev shalom. Aaron was unadulterated justice. But the question, but if it's mitzvah, lasa pshara, how does Moshe Rabbeinu behave differently? The answer is, of course, what does Moshe Rabbeinu represent? Pshara is not emes. It's not emes. So therefore, if you work out both sides to mediate, that one gives a little and one takes less, it's a mitzvah. But Moshe Rabbeinu representing the Torah, which is absolute truth, what does truth say on this? What does justice say? Moshe Rabbeinu has to deliver justice. And because Moshe Rabbeinu was emes, the personification of emes, because of that, he was the conduit for emes to be transmitted to the Jewish people. There, Moshe is Moshe Rabbeinu for that reason. Therefore, when he was told to go to war and destroy the Midianites, he did a besimcha. Of course, there was no holdbacks. There was no, no himself. It was only God's glory and Moshe because he lived for God's glory. This was the ultimate opportunity to destroy the nation that wanted to destroy God's people and bring about this unfathomable chil Hashem. And this is the ultimate kiddush Hashem. Therefore, he did it besimcha.